I'm going to get started. So welcome back. And if you're just joining us, I'm Kathleen Johnston. I'm the director of the Arnold Center for Investigative Journalism here at Indiana University. And that's what we're about today. We're highlighting investigative journalism. And I again want to thank our sponsors. We, you know, we've had a terrific day, these panels. If you didn't get to see them, we did record it. We're going to put it on our website. Several people have asked me that, and the answer is yes, we did record it. Um, and uh, I want to thank our sponsors again. Um, Scripps Howard Foundation, Lumina Foundation, Gannett USA Today Network, the um, Indiana Pro Chapter of SBJ, Indiana Citizen, Hoosier State Press Association, and Hoosier State, Hoosier State Press Association Foundation, say that three times, and Hutton Honors College. And without them, I really want to thank all of them. I really do. Also, it takes a lot more than a village to put something like this on. So um, I want to thank all those behind the scene. Um, and, I, I, and at the risk of missing someone, let me try this anyway. Um, our interim dean here, Walt Gantz, in the back. Uh, our associate dean, uh, Radhika, who's not, I don't think Radhika's here. Um, Darla Raines, Ann Kibler. Emily Rose Harrison, Jay Kincaid, who has stood at that camera all day long, um, Mike Gray, Dave Ernst, Andrew, Kirsten, um, Barb Truesdale with the center, and Craig Lyons, of course, with the center as well. Um, I hope you all will visit our website, arnoldcenter.org, um, so you can read more about the center and what we're trying to do. We're young. We're only a couple of years old. Um, we're hoping to have this as an annual event, so I keep saying it's our first annual event. Um, we want to highlight not just the work of uh, our students, but also investigative journalism. It, you know, you've heard it over and over again today. Um, it's important for our democracy. You know, without a free press, we have no free country. We just don't. And don't anybody let anybody tell you otherwise. Um, you know, at the center, we have 42 students right now working at the center. Four graduate students, and they're right there. There's our grad students here. Um, and um, the rest are undergrads. In the first semester they work for us, they work for course credit, just to show their commitment. And after that, we pay them. So we, we want to get, we pay them an hourly wage. And we do that because they deserve it, and they earn it, and they're working in a newsroom. And we want to send that message that you know, journalism should be <laughs> paid for as well. You know, um, this is a calling for a lot of people, but it's also a job, and we have families to feed too. So we want to get our students to expect that they should be paid for their work, you know. And if you go on our website, you'll see some of the work we do. We work with professional media organizations, and right now our partners are Gray TV, which has um, Gray TV slash Investigate TV. They have 114 plus stations around the country including three here in Indiana, Fort Wayne, South Bend, and Evansville, and uh, USA Today. Those are our main two partners, but we're also partnering with IU Newsnet, which is out of Ann Ryder's broadcast class, and um, they put on a weekly show that air, most of you can see it on Facebook, and our students are helping them on a story about the rise in sexual assaults here at um, IU, which is a problem plaguing all campuses. Um, but we're not going to give IU a pass. They need to... <laughs> They need to fix this as well as anybody else. Um, so go on our website and just take a look at it. You know, just last week, our students produced a story with Gray Television um, on a company that has figured out how to profit off of homeschooling and running it through a um, uh, school's, school um, board down in um, southern Indiana. And, our friends at Hoosier State Press Association, after that uh, story ran, they offered it to all their members. And uh, at least one newspaper, as long as the story was, took, picked it up. And that's sort of keeping with our mission of trying to help news deserts who can't, maybe can't afford investigative journalism. So we want to help them and provide it for them. So um, and last year, for, with our U USA Today, they produced um, what I think is one of the definitive stories on police and tasers. Um, and it was timely. I mean, they're, they're plodding along in this story, doing the data and everything else. And 
Sadly, a, a man was shot and killed up in Minneapolis by a policewoman. And that story has been cited by everybody, including the New York Times. So um, it's nice to get our name out and our students' names out there. And so they're doing work that matters. And that's the thing I want to get across to you. Um, I can't, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Michael Arnold, who um, helped us with a founding endowment for the center. Um, thank you, Michael. Um, but like most organizations, we need to raise more money. So um, Emily Rose Harrison is here, and I know she'd be happy to tell you how to contribute to the Arnold Center if you get a chance. Um, and um, we also have a donation um, button, I believe, on our website. So that's the center. So when I had to come up with a speaker, Sarah would tell you, she wasn't the first choice. And that's because Sarah was on the events committee for the board. And Sarah doesn't go low, she shoots high, and um, not just in her career, but in her, everything she does. And the first person she wanted to get was Maria Ressa, our CNN colleague, a former CNN colleague of both mine and Sarah's and Erica's, um, um, who just won a Nobel Peace Prize, representing journalists and the dangers they do. Um, Sarah would not take no for an answer. Um, she finally found the right combination to get directly to Maria. Mar Mar Maria, sorry. And um, she was interested, but there was one problem. They wouldn't even let her out of the country to pick up her Nobel Peace Prize. So we figured she probably wouldn't get permission to come to Bloomington, Indiana either. So without pressing her further, we started thinking, well, who else should we get? And then it became obvious, well, why not get Sarah, you know? And so Sarah has done some really important work. I, many of you know that I spent 10 years at CNN, and I was there um, shortly before Sarah got, uh, got there. And I had a cousin that was at CNN International. And my cousin said, yeah, you have to meet this really new journalist we have in India. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, CNN's a big organization, right? And, Sarah and I talked a few times, and then Mumbai terror attacks happened. And soon everybody knew about Sarah Seidner. Um, for four days, is that correct? 60 hours, Sarah was on CNN Domestic, CNN International, probably anybody else who picked you up, um, reporting from that terrible terrorist attack. Um, CNN Domestic said, wow, let's grab her. <laughs> and so they took her back after... She did some time in the Arab Spring and others, and she has been the senior domestic reporter, um, correspondent for CNN. And I could go on and on, but you know, it's rare when you have a correspondent that other publications write about. And Sarah's work with COVID and the Floyd um, killing has attracted the praise of other journalists. And with that, I introduce you to my friend, and colleague, Sarah Seidner. The unmasking, which is, always feels weird to me now, I'm so used to wearing it. Um, Kathleen uh, should be recognized for so many things, but one of the hardest things is to try and gather a bunch of journalists. It is like herding cats, but it's more like herding big, wild, nasty cats. Like, it's hard um, trying to get us to call back and, and, and schedule everything. She has been an amazing advocate for you all, for the center, but also for journalists everywhere, and I just think she should be recognized for all the incredible work that she has done. Oh, yes. I also shoot stories, give masks, I do all the things. Okay. Um, so I have a speech that I have written. I sometimes don't, because <laughs> we're just talking here. Um, but I want to say a few things before I get into it, and that is I shouldn't be here. And when I say that, if you look at my background and you look at where I've come from uh, and the life that I led as a child, it doesn't match up with 
going around the world for an organization and questioning everyone from, you know, a chaiwala, a guy making tea, to the president of India or Sri Lanka um, or Pakistan or Egypt. Um, I was uh, a, a mixed race child. My mother is Caucasian. My father is African American. And I was raised by a single mother. And we were poor. And my mother always cringes when I say that because she still feels a bit of the shame. To her, it's shameful to be poor. To me, I had no idea, like, okay, like, that's just the way it was. For a time, I lived without electricity, and I lived without running water, and I lived in the countryside, and I had animals as friends, not people. Um, so I have come from a varied life. Um, from there, you know, things got better. Uh, my mother had the one thing that is rich, and that was an education. Uh, and she always made sure, like, there was no discussions as, as to whether or not I was going to school or to college. It just, there it wasn't a discussion. It was understood that I had to do that, that that was the way to pull us and for her to pull herself uh, out of a scenario and a situation that was very, very, very difficult um, at times. Um, so I appeal to people when they talk about diversity, and I have these conversations every now and then, that this is not just a black, white, Latinx, LGBTQ, you, you know, Native American. It's, it's not just an issue of, of, of race, um, color, and creed. It is also an issue of socioeconomics. Because when you don't have money to buy a car, good luck with that internship. When you don't have the money to spend 40 hours a week, at a station for an entire summer, then what? Because they weren't paying anybody, and I think there are still companies that don't pay their interns. Um, and so, I, you know, in some ways I got lucky that I was able to one summer do that for 40 hours a week for the entire summer for free. Um, but when I got back to school, it was tough. I had student loans. I know what those feels like. They feel very, very heavy. And I'm telling this to you because I want to be open about where I came from. Um, and, you know, it's not always like a fancy sweater. And, well, usually I'm not wearing heels, so um, I don't get too fancy. But I came from a place where things were really, really hard. But there was two things. There was education and there was love. And that is all I needed to propel me because I had the love and trust of my, my, my mother and then those around me. And... Um, it was a hard road to get here. So that being said, now for the other hard stuff. When I was asked to do this, <laughs> I was like, why me? Why me? My title does not say investigative reporter. Okay, so like what the heck am I doing here? I'm on the board. But I do believe, and you'll hear this time and again, that each story is a form of an investigation because you are asking the five W's and the H, who, what, where, when, why, and how. And so if you really care about those answers, sometimes just hearing the answer to that from an official or that's not enough. We have to go deeper than that. What have we learned from watching what has gone on in our own country is that you are not going to always get the truth from the people that you put in power. You aren't always going to get the truth from the people that aren't in power. You have to check it out. You have to look through all of the things that you hear and see and read to get to the truth. And if that is what you are after, then bravo for you. We need you. We need you. My nerves have been on edge all day because I couldn't find the words. <laughs> At first, when I sat down, I said, let, let me give myself just something to, to keep me going and to, to, to keep this conversation going. And I couldn't figure out why I was so nerved out and nervous. I've been in a lot of much harder situations. And I realized that it was because I care so much that we have more people like you coming into this business who care about the truth and who care about democracy and know how important the truth is to a democracy. We are losing that. Sorry. You can see it in your everyday lives. We are losing that. 
and it warms my heart to see these students who are grinding out incredible work that is by no means easy. In fact, no one cares about the time you guys spend crunching data. No one's clapping for you and jumping up and down and saying, great job, great job. But when you put that story out, you've just impacted somebody's life. You've just made a, you've just made a difference. You might not hear about it, but you did. You did make a difference. So it isn't an easy road, journalism. Um, if you start in a newsroom, don't be surprised. If you walk in and there is little guidance, everyone is busy. Mentoring will be spoken about, but rarely practiced. You will be expected to sink or swim. And I literally got this from one place I walked in. They said, sink or swim, your choice, we don't care. There's a thousand other people that have tapes in my office, that have resumes in my office that want this job. Bye, go get us a story. Like literally, you know, you walk in and that's what comes at you. So it's hard. They will expect you to have all the answers when you just got there, while at the same time talking about the fact that you are the new girl or the newbie coming into the newsroom. So there is this expectation that either you go out and find a decent story or you're not meant for this business. They're not right, by the way. Nobody is perfect in the beginning or ever. But that's the sort of thing that you will face in this business because that's just the way it has been. And maybe you all can, can change that a bit. Um, every single thing that you do, learn from it. Every mistake you make, there will be mistakes. I have made mistakes. Learn from them. It is the only way to get really good at this. And it's also a way to feel empathy when somebody else makes one and compassion when someone else, maybe on the other side of the, the recorder, maybe on the other side of the microphone, also makes one. You will learn that we all do it, so be very careful about condemning people and ruining their lives because of some mistake they made. If they keep doing it over and over again, it's no longer a mistake, but that's another story. So there are hundreds of thousands of families out there that are living like you, and there are hundreds of thousands of families out there that aren't. If you are in a situation where you feel like you can't pay your bills, you've got your first job, you are out there and you are, you are you know, struggling, but you are still enjoying the work that you do, think about what it's like to not be able to pay for going out to dinner or to pay for your gas that you're worrying about. And when you start thinking about those things, you may be embarrassed around other people or you may be frustrated now, use that to go find a story about people who are dealing with those issues in their home. They are grown adults trying to make their lives better and their children's lives better. No investigation has ever gone wrong that tried to help somebody lift themselves from a difficult situation, whether it be money or something else. And to me, we get so in our heads sometimes about what the story is and whether it's a good one. If it helps somebody find another way of being and lift themselves out, to me, you've done your job. Did you win an award for it? No, who cares? We're pretty good at congratulating ourselves. We're pretty good at congratulating ourselves. And sometimes I think, why do we do that? Everybody needs to be congratulated, but sometimes I think we do it a little bit too much, and then for some people, it becomes the thing they want to do, which is win an award, get a pat on the back, right? So you need to remember who you're doing this for. This is not for your bosses. Sorry, bosses out there. This is not for your manager. It is not for your assignment editor. It is not for anyone else but the public that you are supposed to be serving. It's not for your own personal resume, although it will be used for your resume. Like, we are in a real work world, right? You have to have things, and you have to have stories, and you have to have, you know, video, and you have to be able to show the work that you can do. But if you keep to your core that this is for the public, this is for your friends, your family, the public at large, the powerful, the not powerful, you, you, runs the gamut. I don't care what color you are. I don't care how rich or poor you are, there is a story that you can be fair about to tell that impacts all those levels. 
Maybe not as much. Maybe they don't care as much here or there. But one thing that I know that we all are is human. And one thing I know about human beings is we all have the same problems. They may be a little varied, but we all have experienced some of the same exact things. So use that. Use your experience in your reporting. It's really important because people will try to strip that from you. They'll try to strip your uniqueness because that's what happens when you do groupthink, right? You get into a place, a newsroom, for example, and the big story of the day is X, right? And everybody wants a piece of that story. Everybody's going after that story. Well, if you're an investigator, you don't have to go after that story, go chasing down the hall of the governor to try to get a comment. Maybe you turn around and you start looking at the lieutenant governor. What's that person doing? Right? There are other ways to get at things and not always following the pack. I think investigative journalists generally don't follow the pack. And if they are on a story that everybody else is on, they always find a deeper, more interesting angle than what everybody else has. It's your job, right? It's your job digging deeper. And hopefully you'll be given some time to do that. Remember who you are when you are doing stories. And that may be counterintuitive, but don't fall into this trap of just doing stories for whomever. Remember your own humanity when you're doing it. It will help guide you on how to treat people, people who may be doing things that are wrong and people who are doing things that are amazing, but you are allowed to be human with all of them. I have had the, the privilege and the pain of sitting down with people from all different backgrounds and walks of life, including a grand dragon from the Ku Klux Klan, a white nationalist in Charlottesville, a man who had people actually be able to change their minds about what they were doing in the Klan and got out all in one day just sitting down with each of these people and listening to their stories. I had someone who told me from a white nationalist organization, he's the head of it, he said, I've never had someone not yell at me, a reporter who hasn't gotten up in the middle of the interview and walked out, I've never had someone listen. Now, I got criticized for that, by the way. Like, you listened to this guy and you gave him a platform, well, guess what, they already have a platform. What do you think Charlottesville was all about? They already have a platform, and they're in their own bubbles, just like everybody else is. So sometimes if you can challenge somebody about what they're saying and thinking, at least you've done that. You've given them somebody to think about, but you treated them like a human being. So guess what happened? When another reporter went to interview him, they had to call me. They had to call me because he said, are you going to do the same thing that she did? I mean, human, first, first. Now, in your career, if you decide to go down this past path, um, I think we need to remember, because of polarizations, polarization, that the stories you do are for all citizens of this country and citizens of the world. Now, they might not appeal to all citizens of country and citizens of the world, but they, that's who they are for, for them to read and for them to understand our world better. You will have excitement and you will have painstaking, mind-bending, needle-in-the-haystack moments where you feel like you're just floundering. The stuff that the movies always sort of passes by, right? They get to the good stuff. You'll be applauded for your work some days, and you will be a demon and demonize the next. Be prepared for that. It's hard to be prepared for it, but be prepared for criticism. There will be triumphs. There will be heartache. There will be mistakes, and no one will ever let you forget them. Someone, because we now have this thing called the internet, <laughs> where your mistake lives on forever. Right? I am still reminded about some of the mistakes I made on a regular basis. Sometimes it's from colleagues ribbing you, and sometimes it's from the public who found something that you did when you were in college. Right? 
And so we're living in this very difficult time. And sometimes, worst of all, there will be a story that you work on, you work really hard on. You try to get all the details, get all the things, and you feel like, okay, this is, this is I got something here. And then it airs. And no one seems to care. You feel small. You put your heart and soul into it. You tried to get all the things right. You tried to do it right. You thought, this is going to at least open people's eyes. I want to play one of those stories for you that, that I did. Um, I'm going to have you guys play number one. Okay, one second. Okay. Am I plugged in? You see me? Full screen. Okay. There it goes full. Chad doesn't even know the law. He's a thug. Right, right. Your friend is a thug. Well, thank you. A thug. That's a Michael Avenatti's brash take no prisoners tactics have helped expose lies about President Trump's knowledge of the $130,000 hush money payment to porn star Stormy Daniels. If folks want to continue to hide this stuff and cover it up, I think it's fantastic because I'm going to out of. And he's revealed millions of dollars in questionable financial dealings by Trump's personal attorney, Michael Cohen. But there's a uh, number of things that are nefarious. But Michael Avenatti is also facing questions about his own financial dealings involving one of his firm's work with a convicted felon. In spring 2017, the firm Egan Avenatti was battling a former partner who said he was owed millions of dollars. Jason Frank accused the firm of failing to pay millions of dollars owed to him, failing to hand over tax returns, and misstating the firm's profits. The case went into arbitration, and a three-judge panel found Avenatti's firm was engaged in a pattern of delay, obfuscation, and unresponsiveness, and ordered Avenatti and others in his firm to sit for a deposition and face questions about the firm's finances. Two days before the deadline for that deposition to take place, the entire legal proceeding stopped. After this man, Gerald Tobin, filed paperwork in Florida that forced Avenatti's law firm into involuntary bankruptcy, an obscure move that effectively froze the arbitration. It's incredibly rare to see these cases. If you look at bankruptcies generally, you know, well less than 1% of bankruptcies are involuntary. Hi, I'm Sarah Seidner with CNN. I had a couple of questions for you. Okay. Can you tell me what kind of investigative work you were doing for Egan Avenatti's law firm? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to stop it there. I'm stopping it there because I will tell you the rest of the story. The rest of the story is it turned out that he was not a private investigator. He had nothing to do with it, that this was a way for Michael Avenatti to get out of being exposed and having his finances exposed. We did not get very many people watching that story. It was in the middle of, as you saw, what the other story was, the firestorm between Stormy Daniels and the President of the United States and Cohen and the whole gaggle. Um, and I remember it airing and thinking, okay, does anyone, is it just me? Like, does anyone care? Because he was on every, every single television station, Articles galore. Every day there was something new. He was getting into everything. And as I was having to cover the, the, the other scandal, the presidential and Stormy Daniels, Daniels thing, I started looking at him because naturally he's everywhere. So who is he? And who he was is someone who really was having major financial problems and some argue using his newfound fame to try and help fix those financial problems. Fast forward a few months and he told people he was going to run for president. And he was. I was still covering him. But that story had already run. So guess what? There was one person, my phone lit up, that did care about this story. And who was that? It was Michael. <laughs> He texted the longest text I've seen in a long time. I was called everything from inhumane to scum of the earth to you're dead to me. It was a really nasty, nasty exchange. And he threatened my job. Go forward a few weeks. 
I still had to cover him. So I picked up the phone and called my boss. I said, you're going to get an angry phone call. My job has been threatened. This is the second time. It is what it is. I just want you to know, I mean, it's going to happen. And my boss, to his credit, said, Sarah, good to know. Now go and do more work. Keep going. I was like, okay. So I did. I had to keep going. I followed him all over the place. We were doing all kinds of different stories. But at that time, everyone wanted a piece of him. He was great sound all over the television. All, he, just, he was so, so smart in so many ways, and yet there was this lingering thing. Fast forward nine months, and he was arrested and convicted uh, for extort, trying to extort Nike. He was just in the last week convicted of stealing money from Stormy Daniels herself, and he faces another big trial in California. Um, which has to do with what? Money. Finances. So we looked back at that story that nobody seemed to care about, and we're like, okay, well, at least we weren't wrong. <laughs> we did see something. It wasn't the popular thing to talk about at the time, but there was something there that deserved to be explained. Every, you know, people were taking sides, good guys, bad guys, Republican, Democrat, don't do this, don't, don't do a story about this because this is so terrible. And that's a whole lot of noise. Do the story. You never know how it's going to impact later on. And that brings me to no story ever dies. They don't. They just change. They don't go away, they don't, because why? Human nature. We all act the same way. There are the scandals that you had back in 1950, there are still the same scandals going forward. You know, if you look back at all of the things that have happened and investigations that have happened, it's basically each one is another iteration of something that has likely already been reported on or investigated at some point, but we're in a new era. And so there are new twists and turns. And so with that, I wanted to play another video to remind some of the folks in here are going to remember this, this story uh, from back in the day. I hope this is the right one. Yeah. OK. Rested in the lot of a South Miami towing service today. The 1972 Pinto was struck from the rear yesterday on US-1 near Ludlam Road. Upon impact, the Pinto's gas tank exploded, trapping Beth and her 16-year-old passenger, Judy Tamburino, inside the flaming car. Tamburino remains in serious condition, and the driver of the other car, 31-year-old Donald Mueller, who was charged in the accident, is in critical condition. The accident is the latest in a long list involving Pintos built between 1971 and 1977. The Pinto has a gas tank behind the rear wheels as, as opposed to laying over the rear axle. And when the bumper is struck from the back, there are bolts on the bumper, and these bolts act like a can opener. You can just imagine the bolts being rammed into the tank, and if they rupture it and then move up, it's just like a can opener opening up the tank. The gas then spills out, and when the gas spills out, if there's any spark, you know, any ignition, you're going to have an immediate flaming automobile. Two years ago, Ford recalled one and a half million. Okay, that story was broken by Mother Jones in 1977. And this was one iteration of that story later on as a lot of the things that were supposed to be recalled, they never, people never brought them in uh, to get fixed. And so these, these things lingered, but there was a huge recall because of the Mother Jones story. Fast forward, um, almost 40 years, and this story appears. Uh, a local station, uh, KHOU, and an investigative reporter named Anna Warner uh, did this, and I happened to be in Dallas at the time um, watching it. Police say one of the car's tires, a Firestone ATX, came apart at highway speed. The Ford Explorer flipped three times, and Jessica was killed. Those are just two of many similar cases the defenders found all over Texas as many as a dozen in the past few years, and all of them with a familiar combination, 
a Ford Explorer, and a Firestone radial ATX tire with what's called a tread separation. That's when this tread literally peels off the tire. Experts say when that happens, with some vehicles, it can mean a devastating rollover crash. Since our investigation ran, dozens of people have contacted us with claims that they or family members have had problems with the tread coming off Firestone radial ATX tires, those tires mounted on Ford Explorers. That after we found as many as 30 deaths nationwide that victims blame on that very combination. But we're not the only ones hearing complaints. We found some people have written to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to tell the federal government about problems they claim they had with tires on Ford Explorers. So, similar, a little bit, right? That led to congressional hearings and huge recalls um, of the tires across the country. Uh, people were experiencing this. And the reason why I showed you those two is one was Mother Jones, not the New York Times, not the Washington Post. Uh, and this one was broken by a local reporter um, that started getting phone calls about something, and she just decided to look into it. Anybody could have, right? I bet you there's someone else that got those phone calls, but they just decided that maybe it wasn't something that was interesting to them. So investigative journalism can be done anywhere in any organization and have a major impact. And by the way, 60 Minutes followed that Firestone story and did an incredible investigation on Explore, I mean, they went to, uh, to another country. I mean, it turned into this very big overarching uh, scenario and situation where they were able to say, like, the company knew about this, and it was just like a, a cost analysis. Same thing with, with Pinto. Um, and I say that to you because you will be doing iterations of stories, and just remember that there are people who came before you. And I'm not saying that so that you can bow down. I'm saying that because they give you a roadmap. You have a roadmap, like how wonderful. You have a roadmap as to how to get this information. The panels that we've had here, they couldn't be more amazing. In fact, I did look at Kathleen and say, why the heck am I doing this? They're the ones that are doing these great stories and they are great. So now I'm gonna take you to just one more proof because you're investigative reporters, you have to have proof that stories never die. This is from 1968, if I can find it. Let's see. Um, one moment. Okay. So this is from 1968. Um, it was the very first story that aired on 60 Minutes. Now I bring 60 Minutes up because I think that they do some wonderful work. I think my timing's right, although I'm seeing some squinting, so I might be off by a year or two with the 68. Uh, but they, they started out, and this is what they say is their first actual story on the broadcast. And they did change the course, by the way, of television journalism, partly because they started making money. Now, you can look at that as good or bad, but they were sort of the first news magazine to really get so many people interested. And they're still in the top 10 uh, of viewership. So someone discovered that this is this would make us some money. This is cool. OK, I can see what's happened here. Um, is there any way to jump on the internet so I can play this? <laughs> Hold on. Students, you have to chime in here. I can use this, right? I'll, I'll use a Bluetooth connection. Or maybe I'll just tell you. I'll just tell you. 60 Minutes did the story, and the title of the story was Policing in America. And what was that story about? The friction between police and the black community. Fast forward to May of 2020. You guys think that's a new story in any way, shape, or form? 
This was their first broadcast, and that was the subject. And they talked to police officers first, and then they talked to the community, and the divide could not have been more severe. And yet, we're back again. And so I play for you something from May of 2020. My stomach hurts. My neck hurts. Everything hurts. Please. Please. Please, I can't breathe. Please, man. Please, man. Uh, 46-year-old George Floyd spent the last minutes of his life begging for one simple thing. A breath. I'm about to die to say. Relax. Man, I can't breathe my face. The begging for breath goes on for three minutes and nine seconds. Mama! Get up and get Mama, in the car I can't. You can't breathe, man. I'll do it. What do you want? I can't breathe. I will, not let you, I will not force you to suffer through the rest of that, but I had to watch that video about a hundred times, it felt like because we were trying to see our own timeline from just the video that we had. We didn't have the, the body cam video yet, but the timing was off when they first reported it, when the police reported it, when there was the initial uh, investigative report from the police, their timing was off. And so we kept asking them, this doesn't match. And they kept saying, no, we're sticking with this in the affidavit. So I was like, okay. So we went back through and looked minute by minute, how long did this go on from what we had? And we made that clear, like this is the only video that we have, these are the two angles, this is what we, we see and this is the timing. Um, fast forward, uh, I was out there for almost a year, uh, back and forth in Minneapolis. And that's something I do wanna share with you. Um, that community is remarkable. And for anyone who hasn't been there, do not judge a book by its cover. In other words, if you judge it from just what you were seeing on TV or the articles, it is a wonderful place. And I felt part of the community. I stayed there so long, it, it felt like another home to me, um, which is why I kept coming back, because I did care. You can say what you want, but I did care. I wanted things to be good, because the people there are good people. All of them, they're good people. And they wanted to live in a decent way. And here it is, everyone thinks like the whole place is burning down all the time. It's not, it's not. There are other things going on there uh, that are both wonderful and not so great. So I kept going back. But while we were covering this, a lot of things happened to give you investigative reporters and to reporters everywhere a clue about the way in which we have started to lose a little bit of trust in authority again, because it's cyclical, right? So on the air, this is my colleague. Uh, okay. You walked away. I'm sorry? You're under arrest. Okay. Do you mind oh, telling me why I'm under arrest, sir? Why, why am I under arrest, sir? Okay. You are arrested in live on CNN. We've been told before that we are with CNN. If you're just tuning in, you are watching our correspondent, Omar Jimenez, being arrested by state police in Minnesota. We're not sure why our correspondent is being arrested. Hang on one second, Allison. Let's listen into what these officers are saying. Live on the air, our reporter is standing out there doing his job. Before you see that, you can hear him saying to them, I didn't put the whole clip on here because it's, it's long, but he says to them, hey, where do you want us to go? He, he's very calm. He's talking to the police. Where do you want us to go? We, we see there are people sort of running the streets. They said, clear all the streets. Where do you want us to go? No response. Just, hey, guys, I'm, I'm ready to work with you, so where do you want us? He says it again. Nothing. 
Before he knows it, his hands are behind his back, and he's being cuffed. A tweet came out from the state police that day, and it said that they couldn't identify whether or not he was with the media. Complete lie. I couldn't believe it. Because I woke up, I was up all night, he was doing the morning shift, I was doing the late shift, things were on fire, things were happening. I woke up, I'm watching this, what? And then I see this statement, and I thought, of all the times to do this, this was live on the air, just like one of our panelists, Tom Powell, talked about. That is not what happened, but some people believe that's what happened because they're only looking at that. They're not looking at what actually happened. And so the challenge for you guys is trying to figure out how to get those who want to believe one thing to see the reality of what's going on. I was shocked at that moment, but I was also heartened by this one, because I don't want to leave you with all negative stuff. I was heartened by this one. Same place, same area in Minneapolis. I, I apologize. I'm sorry. The Floyd family has asked if you are going to get justice for George Floyd by making sure that the other officers are arrested and that eventually convicted. They, they want and I know that there are things that you cannot control, but they want to know if the other officers should be arrested in your mind and if you see that they should all four be convicted in this case. And this is the Floyd family right now? This is the Floyd family. To, to the Floyd family, um, being silent or not intervening to me, you're complicit. So I don't see a level of distinction any different. Um, so. Uh, obviously, it, the charging and those decisions will have to come through our county attorney's office. Certainly, the FBI is investigating that. But to the Floyd family, I want you to know that my decision to fire all four officers was not based on some sort of hierarchy. Mr. Floyd died in our hands, and so I, I, I see that as being complicit. So that, that is about as much as I, and I apologize to the Floyd family if I uh, am not more clear, but um, uh, I don't see a difference. In, in that was the police chief, uh, the Minneapolis police chief. Complete happenstance, none of that was planned. I happened to be standing at the memorial. Someone said, hey, go try to see if there's a protest elsewhere. I said, no, most of the people, this is, there's something to be done here. We were standing around try, talking to interviewing people who were there, and I was in the middle of an interview with a woman who had the grace to tell me to turn around because the chief was here. And I said, the chief of what? Like, no way is the chief of police here. Because they were under threat. I mean, people were angry. And I turned around, and there he was. He had just gotten up from praying near the spot where George Floyd died. I had a camera, I had a microphone, I had a cameraman, and I had a producer. And I was like, we got to get him. Let's go. We got to see if he'll talk. There's no press conference. This wasn't something that was. So sometimes you've got to think on your feet. I had not prepared a single thing. I hadn't thought of a single thing. But I knew what the public wanted to know, what the Floyd family wanted to know. What do you think of this? Should the other officers be arrested? What, what do you think of what your department did? And I have never in my career until that day had a police officer speak on something that was going to cost his city a lot of money. There was a potential huge lawsuit, which did happen, and where there was a criminal case that was pending. Because guess what answer you almost always get? We cannot discuss this because there is litigation or a criminal case is pending. He didn't do that. And boy, was I not ready. <laughs> I wasn't prepared. And so I started in my head thinking, OK, what else do I need to ask him? At the very same time, Don Lemon was interviewing the Floyd family. I had no idea. I was out in the field. I had no idea. So my producer, smartest guy, Jason calls him up and says, we have the chief. And they said, no, 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 listen, guys, we, got, we have the Floyd family. And then they, then they listened again. Someone else called him up and said, no, 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 the chief of police is standing right now with our reporter who's out there. 
And so that was the first time that the Floyd family spoke to the chief or anyone from the police department through me. And the pressure was real. It was powerful. I could feel it. I was shaking. Like afterwards, I break a little bit. You can hear my voice break because I didn't want to screw it up. I was like, if I misspeak or say the wrong thing right now, I've just, like, I'm done. I'm done. And I don't mean that I'm going to get fired. I mean that I'm done. I will never forgive myself for this. So you're going to be in scenarios sometimes where you have to think on your feet. But if you do it from the perspective of, I'll go back to this, human beings and what the public wants to know, but also what the families want to know, and frankly, what the police want to know. Because that was a moment where a police chief showed incredible compassion. Did you notice something? I said, the Floyd family is speaking to me. They have a question for you. And he said, the Floyd family? And what did he do? Did anyone notice? Everyone noticed that. He took off his cap. And what did that signify? Respect. Respect for a family he knew was in the worst times in their lives and he knew was likely going to sue the city and there was going to be a trial and it's his department that is under the gun. But he showed respect. It was one of those moments that people still come up to me and say, I, I, I can't believe that happened. I had an, a, a man who had just arrived six months ago from Africa and he came up to me and he said, you know, I always felt like the police weren't human until I saw him do that. This is just one guy. And I started crying. I was off camera. I just started, I just started, I had to like gather my thoughts. I, it, there were so many things going on that day, but that was a moment of incredible compassion. And it was a policeman who was showing that incredible compassion. We need to show all the sides of the story, regardless of what you think, regardless of your biases, and we all have them, right? But we need to try and bring people in to see how we can come together and how we can show respect to one another, even when we're under the gun, even when it's hard, even when money's involved, because that usually keeps people from doing things. Um, Lastly, I will say this and then you can ask questions. I said I was only going to go 20 minutes. I used to think it was really hard when I started in journalism. We had this ancient technology called microfiche. And you had to go to this secretive place where you had to be quiet, the basement of the library, to find the huge machine that clunked along to find old articles. And it was so exhausting, just trying to get a tiny bit of information. You were calling public information officers for statistics. You had to wait by the phone. I mean, I never had a boyfriend disappointed me more than trying to get information out of some of these agencies. You're sitting there and you're begging, please, I, I have a deadline, please call me back, I need these numbers. And it seemed so hard and tedious. I loved it when I got the answers. It felt great when to put a story on, but it was tedious, it felt tedious. You guys have an incredible opportunity because guess what you have at your fingertips? Literally all the information just about in the world to look into. Here's why I think it's harder for you now because so much of the information on the internet is disinformation. You know this, right? That's where we are right now. Whether it is social media or something else, you never know if the information you think you're getting is right. You don't even know if the website is the proper official website, because I've almost gotten caught by that, where I've got on and someone's done one letter different, and you think you're on the site, it looks exactly the same, and then you realize as you're reading down, like, wait, they would never say that. I don't, no, this isn't right. So you will have to fight against that every single story and every day of your life now. It's where we are. It's where we are. And if we keep going down this road where nothing is true and nothing is a fact and we can't agree on facts, then we will live a lie and democracy will die. Like, I'm not being hyperbolic. If we can't agree on facts, 
The next iteration of that is, who are we? We're living a lie. We, we, we literally can't agree on what's real. That's a problem. And I'm afraid for us. I am afraid for our democracy. And I think about it far too much. Because you are the good news. You are the good news. You care. You're fresh. You're ready. You want to talk about things. You want to get to the bottom of things. We need journalism students, and particularly investigative journalism students. It will not be easy. There will be days when you do so many things that are dark and bad because we're supposed to be shining a light on things that are going wrong that it will sometimes make you wonder, and this has happened to me, so I'm speaking from experience, about your own humanity. It's, it, it's likely going to happen to you. It's something that we all talk about, but don't talk about publicly. But the anxiety, depression, all those things, it happens to us too. You can't take in all this negative information and see bad things in the world and not have it affect you. So I want to leave you with this. It is a Cherokee proverb or story or fable, um, it, usually attributed to the Cherokee nation. And it is this. Inside of us, we are all struggling with two wolves. One wolf, evil. Jealous, lies, hatred, violence. The other wolf, hope, light, truth, peace, happiness, compassion. Who wins in your life and in your heart? Who wins? The one you feed. Remember that when you're out there and things look bleak. Remember that when you're talking to someone who you're going after, because their lives are affected too. Find the compassion as you're going out and doing this, but remember that the work that you do can change the world. It can. And if it's not the world at large, the world around you. Isn't that important? The world around you is just as important as the proverbial world, because it's your world. Thank you. Thank you. Are there, are there any questions? I will answer anything. It's been a long day. You guys want to know what my salary was in my first job? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, my first salary was uh, $20,000. I thought I was rich. I literally, because some of my fellow students were making 16 and 14. So I was like, oh my god, wow. And then I tried to live on that. Wasn't enough. My second job, do you know how much I got paid for that one? 19.5, I took a pay cut. Do you know why I took a pay cut? Because I wanted to go to that, I, I thought the station was good and they, they wanted me and I felt like I could grow there. So I left and I did it. Didn't end up too shabby. It was a great place to work. Got paid in sunshine, it was in Florida, they say that a lot. What I'm telling you that for is because some of those salaries are still the same and that to me needs to change. Maybe that's something you guys will impact. Um, but I say that because I enjoyed it so much, I would have done it for free if I could have afforded it and didn't have student loans hanging over my head. That's how much I loved. I was like, don't tell anyone, but I will do this for free. <laughs> that's changed, by the way, because it takes over your life and you, you pay for it in many, many ways. Family pays for it, unfortunately, and not with money, but other things. Um, but it really makes me so incredibly happy to see you sitting in those chairs and that you are going into this world of work. We need you. We need you. Not want, we need you. We need smart minds. We need data-driven journalism. We need you guys, truly. Every organization needs you. Hi. Uh, 
Just ask some question. Uh, okay, I, oh, sorry. Uh, I know you have been being the journalist for several countries like India, like the states, and you say you like you you concerned about the states of democracy. <laughs> you say about people not care about truth or people need to see the fact. But I'm from uh, I I'm from China. I think I concern about that more than you do. <laughs> and I want to know what you think about the difference in between make, make, doing the news in different countries, especially what specially uh, United States provide for you. I've lived um, in, thank you for that question, it's a very good one. I've lived in India, traveled and worked in Afghanistan and Libya and Egypt. Uh, I moved and lived in Jerusalem um, and, and did a lot of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, and, I, and I fear that we're going down that road here where it's so entrenched that the two sides can't find common ground. Um, I'm worried about democracy everywhere. <laughs> because if you look at what's happening, if you open your eyes to the world and you start looking at what's happening other places, they're going through it too. Do you know why? Same reason we are. Disinformation. Right? I mean, it's the same, we're, again, human beings. That's all, we're all made up of the same six elements, right? We all have similar things that we do. We like to believe what we want to believe, right? Our way of life is right. Your way of life is wrong. So I'm worried about it everywhere. I do think even in this country, more reporters are being arrested than in the past in places like China, right? They try to quiet dissent. That's happening in a lot of different places. In Mexico, reporters are being killed regularly, and we don't talk about it enough. It is becoming, to me, this is my personal opinion, but if you look at some of the numbers, it's becoming more dangerous to be a journalist. Just to tell the truth, imagine that. Just telling the truth, just trying to find the truth, becoming more dangerous which is why I go back to this. I'm so happy that you guys, although don't get up and run out of here. I don't want to do that. But I'm so, I'm, I'm so happy that you're here because you, you can have an impact on your local community. And please, everyone have the biggest dreams in the world, but please remember that local communities are still a wonderful place to mine for stories and to live and to work and to get to know people. My favorite job was in Oakland, California. I loved that company. I loved the camaraderie. I loved my team, right? The people that I worked alongside. So don't discount that if you find someone that you really love, you can stay. It's okay. You don't have to be this idea of success. Your idea of success should be good for you, good for your family, good for your life. Don't look at everybody else. It's an endless bit of heartache because there's always someone better and bigger and richer and whatever. Find you, know thyself, you'll be fine. And with that, thank you so very much. Thank you. You can't leave here, but stay right up here. Is this back on? Yeah. So if you'll just indulge me for a minute, um, I, I want to thank a couple other people, the ambassadors, the Markey people, and our board, you know, um, Charlene um, Brown is watching this from uh, Facebook Live or one of them, and she helped organize this, and I really appreciate it, and everybody on the board, so all the board members are here, so thank you very much. So, so I've had to sit here. Anybody who knows me knows I bleed cream and crimson, <laughs> right? Okay? So I've had to sit today and listen to the Wisconsin Badger garbage from Walt Bogdanich, and then I had to listen to the fighting online and keep my mouth shut from Tom Powell. And I'm telling you, I'm a Hoosier through and through. I graduated from here. My mother graduated from here. My siblings graduated from here. We're Hoosiers. <laughs> so when I asked Sarah if she would do this, I said, there's an honorarium. I'm not taking it. Don't you want to know what it is? I'm not taking it. Don't tell me. I don't want it. I said, Sarah, is there anything we can give you? What did you tell me? 
She said she wanted an IU pen. <laughs> so then I thought about this a little bit, and I thought, it's for you. So the first item in there, pen. it's a big pen. So, but I figured this out. You know, I, I worked at CNN, and red and white is the colors on the air, and that's kind of cream and crimson, right? So I thought, let's deck Sarah out for her live shots, all right? So... We have a pen in here, but here's the rest of it. You might want to pull it out. Oh, my goodness. Wow. All right. Get the picture. My university, by the way, I'm a Florida Gator. Just had to put that out there. <laughs> but I yeah, right. can show. How do I look? <laughs> right. I love a baseball cap, by the way. As someone who owns one of these IU oh uh, CNN rain jackets, <laughs> we got a new one. This is the wow. next live shot on CNN. Wow. All right. <laughs> this is awesome. This is really we got cool. to this. And then for her casual days. I, I think my dean's on the phone, right? My old dean. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. It was a great day. Thank you very much.